just uh, giving a few more. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. We're just giving a couple of more minutes uh, for people to join the webinar. Um, we're seeing that uh, more and more participants are joining. So I'm just going to give one more minute and then we can start. Okay, so uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Verania Chow. I'm the thematic lead on climate, gender, and inclusion with UNDP's climate strategies and policy team at headquarters. Uh, first of all, happy International Women's Day to everyone. And before we begin today's webinar, I would like to share some logistics. Uh, we have interpretation into French and Spanish. Please use the, global, um, the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to select your language. Today's session is being recorded, so we will share the recording on the NDC Partnership YouTube channel and we'll share the PowerPoint uh, presentations with participants. Um, we are holding the session in webinar format with attendee microphones muted, but we welcome you introducing yourself in the chat and share any questions to our presenters via the Q&A function. Thank you for joining the second session of the NDC Partnership Enhancement Webinar Series on Social Inclusion and Gender Equality in Long-Term Strategies. This session led by UNDP, the United Nations Development Program on the margins of International Women's Day is meant to provide guidance on gender equality and social inclusion integration for the NDC Partnership thematic call on long-term low emissions development strategies and nationally determined contributions and disease enhancement. Today, I believe is a perfect day to learn more about and reflect upon the opportunity we have to advance gender equality and social inclusion through climate action. Experience has shown that climate change and environmental stress perpetuates and intensify pre-existing disadvantages and structural inequalities, especially those between women and men, and in particular in poorer parts of the world. We know that often women and marginalized groups face unequal access to economic resources, climate-related uh, information, and decision-making. And therefore, as countries are continuing to update and implement their shorter and long-term national climate pledges, there is a unique opportunity to articulate and leverage the integration of social dimensions and women's empowerment. UNDP, through its Climate Promise Initiative, has supported over 100 countries uh, to integrate gender equality considerations within the NDC governance structures, planning processes, and policy frameworks. We believe that the transition to a green economy must offer opportunities to change gender stereotypes and leave no one behind. Action needs to start now on both short-term and long-term strategies to prevent the green transition from reinforced discrimination against women and girls. Long-term strategies can transform, if well-planned, systems and power structures in ways that promote gender equality and social inclusion, not only to address differences in vulnerability, but also to build upon the knowledge, capabilities, and priorities so that different groups of people can contribute to climate solutions. It is critical then to strengthen the integration of gender equality and social inclusion considerations in policy formulation and implementation to ensure that both women and men, indigenous peoples and local communities and youth and other groups benefit from budgetary allocations to climate action. This requires better synergies and a more systematic integration on how a country's climate policies can help achieve or promote gender-related objectives and whether climate policies can take into account the gender differentiated impacts of climate change to avoid further increase in the gender gap. So today we will share with you examples and experiences from countries from Nigeria and Colombia and from partners such as the UNFCCC regarding steps to integrate gender and social inclusion considerations into long-term strategies and enhanced NDCs 
For example, how the NDC's short-term actions support in building the blocks for the long-term vision in the area of gender equality and social inclusion. Also, we will hear the enabling conditions and lessons learned and the synergies between NDCs and long-term strategies in terms of increasing on ambition on social inclusion and gender equality. And the perspectives from the international process and relevant frameworks to support gender equality integration in long-term strategies. It is my pleasure to introduce our fantastic panelists to, the, to our panelists. Thank you for joining us today. Our first panelist, Ms. Halima Bawa Bawari, Director and Special Assistant at the technical level to Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Environment. Ms. Baba Bawari was formerly the Acting Director of the Department of Climate Change in the Federal Ministry of Environment and the Head of Division for Vulnerability and Adaptation. Ms. Baba Bawari also coordinated and delivered for Nigeria the National Action Plan on Gender and Climate Change in 2020 the updated nationally determined contributions in 2021, and the adaptation communication in the same year, among others. Without further ado, I will now give the floor to Ms. Halima Baba Bawari. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and happy Women's Day, everyone. Um, with that being said, uh, I would just like to build upon the initial talk from my, the last presenter. Um, I, being an uh, adaptation and vulnerability person, I would like to start from that point. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, I want to give you a picture of Nigeria's climate change vulnerabilities and impacts. Basically, as you all know, that Nigeria, alongside its other African countries, we contribute about 4% or less of the global emissions, but we are left to cope with the devastating impacts of climate change. Our economies are battered by climate change. In Nigeria, basically, it's negatively affecting our agricultural and water resources um, sectors. And in Nigeria, classic signs of climate change impacts in Nigeria include desertification, sea level rise, alongside coastal erosion, and devastating terrible, terrible floods. The journey we've made so far in trying to ameliorate uh, impacts of climate change through policy mostly is being that in 2016, just like every other country uh, within the UNFCCC, uh, we did our INDC with a 20% conditional and 45% uh, unconditional rather, and a 45% conditional BAU levels by 2030. Incidentally, for us in Nigeria, gender inclusion was out in the INDC, so we tried to work on that in 2020 by uh, producing the National Action Plan on Gender and Climate Change for Nigeria. And in the same 2021, as uh, the presenter earlier said, we had our NDC updated with the conditional parts of our commitment increasing to 47% in all the seven sectors. Still to figure out how Nigeria can achieve its new climate ambition. In 2021, we developed a long-term vision document, which is towards elaborating the long-term low emission development strategy, the LTLED. In other words, Nigeria currently has an LTV, not an LTS yet. So in 2021, uh, we had the energy transition plan uh, released and done, and this gave the commitment Nigeria has for uh, net zero being at 2060, especially in the energy sector. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what, are the, what were the entry points that we used in producing the NDC, the NAP GCC, and the LTV? Basically, we start off by talks between the coordinating ministry, the, that's the Minister of Environment, on behalf of the government, alongside the international partners or national partners as the case may be that would support the country. We agree on a TOR and then we go on and uh, appoint, select and appoint uh, an expert. Then we also have this platform we call the Interministerial Committee on Climate Change. It's basically a stakeholders consultation platform. It includes government and non-governmental private sector. It also includes the experts, researchers, uh, the civil society, 
as I said, it's a, a consultation group. Um, then we also had the, the fact that we had existing documents uh, we used for the survey and analysis of whatever uh, climate action we had then, whether it's the uh, NAP GCC or the NDC or the LTV. We also tried to gain the highest political will. In this case, we made sure that the Federal Executive Council headed by the president considered and approved the documents that we made. So this way we have highest level approvals and commitments. Regarding gender and social inclusion in the NDC especially, we already had the NRGCC. Uh, we set out to have gender mainstreaming in uh, six priority areas of the NDC. However, when the updating of the NDC was done, we looked at uh, trying to do a gender analysis that didn't quite work because of time constraint. So we had a study being done uh, on how to mainstream gender in Nigeria's NDC. This was done in uh, the middle of 2021 too. Next slide, please. Okay, what were the enabling conditions? Are the elements that uh, helped us to uh, have a good NDC and a NAP GCC? As I said earlier, that consultative platform gave uh, ownership. Also, the highest level political support was there, existing policies and documents held, and particularly the use of in country experts really helped to kind of ground truth, whatever results that we were having. And then the NDC partnership weekly meetings really helped during the NDC updating. So synergies and constant communication with all the partners, all the stakeholders helped. And of course, engaging the national, uh, the subnational level government helped because at the end of the day, they would be the ones um, uh, how will I say, expressing or implementing the uh, climate action uh, projects and policies too. Uh, the synergies you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, basically it's that uh, the synergies between the NDCs and the LTVs is that they have similar visions, low emission pathway things. They also have, the sectors are similar in as much as NDC says seven, LTV says nine, but they are basically the same. They all both have gender consideration. And this, uh, the fact that we have an established governance structure by way of the coordinating ministry and the ICC kind of um, helps. And then the policy alignment, you know, helps. Planning also helps as um, you would hear. We have the NDC having sectoral action plans, which can be a, a building block or base for the LTS as it unfolds. Next slide on barriers. So what were the barriers? It's, it was a really exciting time, very uh, stressful, but we learned a lot. The barriers, of course, was that there was poor knowledge and capacity on gender issues and what it was, what the considerations would be, how we would implement. We also, as a result of poor knowledge and capacity, we had a shortage of experts to select and engage, especially at the national level. We also, of course, like the whole world, had issues coming out of the results of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, you can't, uh, it's difficult engaging experts, looking for them, identifying them, having meetings, even if it were Zoom. Then we have the procurement process delayed by the national government and the partners, I must say, sometimes, which didn't allow us to have a proper in-depth gender analysis as we would have preferred. Then there's this difficulty in exchanging or getting information and data collection, which I think basically it's our poor collaboration ethics among the partners and the stakeholders. Data archiving is not too good. Bureaucracy can be challenging. Then we had the issue of funding. You want to have a cross-cutting issue like gender, you need to have funds really allocated to it so that the activities can go on uh, easily. Next slide, please. On the building blocks. On the building blocks, one more. Okay. On the building blocks, you have um, the fact that 
the L NDC coming earlier than the LTV and LTS would, I would think it's an uh, added advantage because they have similar goals, as I said earlier, documents are similar, data, you, you can spoon from what we've done on the NDC for the LTS. Capacity building had been done at the NDC level, which has enabled increase in experts within the country also. The governance structure is already there and the, the institutions and the processes we've already experienced from the NDC levels. On the, uh, on the right hand side, you see the next steps. Uh, the next step for the NDC, of course, is revision of the sectoral action plan that we already have for some of the sectors and then development of the ones that we don't have for the added sectors, the water and the waste. For the LTV, of course, we expect a very robust uh, LTS thereafter. Next slide, please, on good practices. So with the group practices and what lessons have we learned? Well, the appointment of a country facilitator was very good. Working with our officers helped the process too. Then the regular NDC partnership meetings I mentioned earlier were good. Uh, they helped keep us on track and in shape. Then updating of the NDC itself gave us an opportunity to look at our NDC where the gaps were and we tried to uh, suture all those. Then we had the holistic and sustained multi-stakeholder engagement. This helps in effective coverage of our NDC sectors. Then the diversity of the partners helps bring in their collective comparative uh, areas of comparative um, advantage. Then the issue of what climate action contributes to social inclusion and gender equality. I would think that all other climate action we had prior would provide existing documents and roadmaps that will enable gender and uh, equity and equality and social inclusion. It also will has we already have the political buying, we've got the awareness. This will help in ensuring that there is inclusion when implementing. And last but not the least, I would think that effective application and ensuring that there is progress in integrating uh, gender equality, social inclusion in our uh, processes, whether it's the LTS or whatever process thereafter, we will need to really monitor and evaluate as we go. With that being said, I would... Uh, like to thank you. I think that's my last, last slide. Thank you for listening to me and I apologize, the lighting is not so good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lavo Bawari, um, for your interesting contributions uh, about key steps and elements and, and the relevance of having and building upon technical capacities in countries and also the role uh, um, of, of the subnational level governments and, uh, and the relevance of engaging them, particularly uh, when it comes to implementation. Thank you so much. Um, the next presentation will be in Spanish. So please uh, switch to English if, um, if needed. Um, our next panelist is Ms. Jessica Pinilla Orozco, a specialist in public policy and gender justice, a professional and researcher at the National University of Colombia an expert in gender and climate change with 12 years of experience in gender mainstreaming at the policy level. Ms. Pinilla supported the government of Colombia in integrating gender and social inclusion dimensions in the development of its long-term vision. Jessica, the floor is yours, thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Verania. Muy buenos días para todos y para todas. Le salió hoy, 8 de marzo, Día Internacional de la Mujer. Qué buen momento para compartirles esta experiencia de cómo ha sido la inclusión del enfoque de igualdad de género en las estrategias de largo plazo para el control de emisiones en Colombia. Siguiente. Esta es una experiencia, eh, siguiente diapositiva, por favor. En, esta es una experiencia que en Colombia representó un desafío gigante. En Colombia somos aproximadamente 53 
millones de personas de las cuales el 52% somos mujeres. Y en esta población, eh, en este país con tanta diversidad, incluir el enfoque de género en la estrategia de largo plazo tenía varios retos. Por eso, desde el 2019, iniciamos con eh, la construcción de una visión país de género y cambio climático que permitiera evidenciar desde el liderazgo del Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible las diferentes necesidades, roles, habilidades e intereses de hombres y mujeres para participar en la gestión del cambio climático, de manera que todos los sectores se sensibilizaran y empezaran a construirse estrategias puntuales que nos permitieran integrar el enfoque de género de una manera transversal. Siguiente, por favor. Dentro de esas herramientas eh, se construyeron eh, cajas de herramientas, programas de capacitación, eh, desarrollos para la sensibilidad sectorial, territorial, se, con, se consolidó la nominación de un punto focal de género y cambio climático ante la Convención Marco de Naciones Unidas sobre el Cambio Climático que nos permitió empezar a participar en las negociaciones de género y cambio climático, sobre todo pensando en la necesidad de los recursos para que los países que estamos en desarrollo podamos realmente implementar las estrategias necesarias para avanzar hacia la igualdad de género. Cuatro aspectos fueron fundamentales en estos pasos para la integración del enfoque de género y es que estas herramientas se construyeron de manera que las metas y las medidas de las contribuciones nacionalmente determinadas para el país fueran un elemento transversal. No podíamos pensarnos el enfoque de género sin pensarnos cuáles eran esas metas y medidas y la capacidad instalada que tenía cada uno de los sectores que va a estar encargado de implementar esas metas y medidas en términos de género. Desde ahí, desde el 2019, también inició la construcción de la estrategia climática de largo plazo E2050, una formulación de 19 meses con un amplio proceso participativo y nueve apuestas específicas que están en sincronía con esas NDC y eh, el avanzar también hacia un enfoque de género responsivo transformador, ya no de esa primera sensibilización que había antes del 2019, sino pensando en que la política pública tenía que tener medidas habilitantes para integrar el enfoque de género. Y desde allí entonces empieza también la construcción de la hoja de ruta para la formulación del Plan de Acción de Género y Cambio Climático de Colombia, que en este momento está en formulación también bajo el liderazgo del Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible. Siguiente. Esas condiciones eh, necesarias para tener unos resultados eh, positivos pasaron por vincular a los equipos de trabajo de todos los sectores personas que comprendieran, si no el vínculo entre género y cambio climático, por lo menos la necesidad de integrar enfoque de género. Desde allí se crearon entonces, bajo el liderazgo también del Ministerio, una serie de comités de géneros en el sector de minas y energía, en el sector de transporte, en el, en el sector de comercio, industria y turismo, en el sector eh, de vivienda, y con esa capacidad instalada se empezaron a enlazar los temas de género y cambio climático, entendiendo que tuvimos la necesidad de eh, darle un alcance también al concepto de género, porque las discusiones son muchísimas y se van transformando, los conceptos se transforman, sobre todo lo que tiene que ver con eh, la comunidad eh, diversa y otros desarrollos de género que, que viene teniendo el mundo en, en, actualmente. También eh, se construyeron unos principios fundamentales, unos lineamientos, unos criterios, siempre desde el enfoque de acción sin daño. Ustedes saben que Colombia es un país particular que eh, recientemente empieza a salir de una situación de conflicto armado irregular de más de 60 años, que todavía está en un proceso de implementación del acuerdo de paz y que las agendas de cambio climático y de género empiezan también a cruzarse con esa agenda de paz y con esa agenda de desarrollo sostenible y que eso también implica un desafío 
pensando siempre en el aumento de la ambición, pensando siempre desde la interseccionalidad. Colombia es un país que tiene más de 87 pueblos indígenas, alrededor de 10 millones de comunidades afrocolombianas, y eso también, eh, pensando en, en la interseccionalidad, pues representó un gran reto. Siguiente. Dentro de las barreras que se presentaron para implementar el proceso, eh, la primera barrera era abordar eh, las, las brechas de género que tiene este país, el acceso a salud, no solamente salud sexual y reproductiva que tienen las mujeres en Colombia, sino a salud en general, a los servicios de salud, a los mecanismos de salud, la brecha en términos de educación, sobre todo en lo que corresponde a la educación eh, universitaria, a la ed educación en temas específicos, especializaciones o maestrías, todavía la, la brecha sigue siendo bastante amplia, eh, la brecha laboral todavía en un país que eh, es 82% o depende del de 82% de la economía agrícola eh, y agropecuaria, es muy difícil empezar a proponer estrategias de integración de igualdad de género y cambio climático eh, co que correspondan a resolver esas necesidades planteadas por cada una de las brechas en el reconocimiento de esos impactos diferenciales también hubo un reto y una barrera gigante desde la interseccionalidad porque la amplitud de pueblos indígenas, comunidades afrocolombianas y la actual categoría también reconocida para la población campesina hace que las necesidades y asimismo las posibilidades de gestión del cambio climático fueran eh, muy dispares el reconocimiento de las partes, de las partes interesadas y eh, el foco que tienen en ciertos temas. Hay un foco muy fuerte por los temas de transición justa de la fuerza laboral, hay un foco muy fuerte por los temas de eh, economía circular, por los temas que crucen con, con la implementación del acuerdo de paz, sin embargo hay muchos otros temas de necesidades específicas eh, productivas, de necesidades de fortalecimiento organizativo, de necesidades de procesos de sostenibilidad, de lo que corresponde al cambio climático en los territorios que todavía no tienen un eco, yo diría que es suficiente en esas partes interesadas y que también ha representado una barrera. A veces hay muchas partes interesadas en un mismo tema y otros temas se van quedando sin una posibilidad de recursos. Y otra barrera que fue y ha sido muy importante es el tema de las temporalidades. Eh, a veces los, las, las, los apoyos específicos, los proyectos o los programas vienen con unos ajustes de tiempo y unas metas específicas que no corresponden a los procesos desarrollados en países como Colombia, en donde las problemáticas tienen unos cruces bastante complejos. Siguiente. Dentro de los impactos eh, importantes de, de los pasos es que todas las apuestas fueron definidas teniendo en cuenta las metas y medidas de la ANS y que se incluyó, y esto es muy importante en términos de la transición energética por la que este momento atraviesa el país, la formulación de una estrategia de transición justa de la fuerza laboral que está considerando cuáles son los sectores que necesariamente necesitan eh, ser priorizados para transformarse, para no dejar a nadie atrás, para que las mujeres puedan acceder a ese fortalecimiento de capacidades que requiere esa transformación energética, energética en los nuevos puestos que se van a crear y para encontrar unas condiciones más dignas. En esto el Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible está trabajando de la mano con la OIT y con el Ministerio de Trabajo. En este momento se priorizaron tres sectores, el, el sector energía, el sector transporte y el sector agricultura, teniendo en cuenta también los desarrollos económicos del país. Siguiente. Dentro de las buenas prácticas y lecciones aprendidas está la necesidad de eh, desarrollar y continuar fortaleciendo los procesos participativos con gobiernos, con academia, con organizaciones de mujeres, con el apoyo de la promesa climática de PNUD eh, desde la estrategia 2050 y también para la formulación del plan de acción de género y cambio climático del país. Se hizo un proceso 
en 18 departamentos con organizaciones de mujeres, también se hicieron alrededor de 11 consultas con pueblos eh, indígenas, alrededor de 8 consultas con eh, comunidades afrocolombianas que permitieron identificar necesidades, que permitieron también proponer eh, aspectos fundamentales para la gestión del cambio climático que fortalecieron las apuestas de creación de conocimiento climático, de gestión de biodiversidad, de transición justa de la fuerza laboral, de pensarse en unas ciudades más sostenibles, de tener una movilidad y una infraestructura que permitiera el desarrollo del país con una economía industrializada y el incremento de una capacidad de adaptación también de las comunidades, porque a veces eso también es una lección a veces esta capacidad de adaptación de las comunidades está pensada eh, solamente en, en términos de eh, la, la mitigación y lo que la mitigación puede generar en términos de adaptación, pero hay también unas estrategias específicas de adaptación que parten de los conocimientos ancestrales. También es una lección aprendida el trabajo interdisciplinario, el trabajo intersectorial, tener mensajes clave, claves de género y cambio climático y pensarse el fortalecimiento de capacidades de todos los sectores. Esas son algunas de las buenas prácticas y lecciones aprendidas. Yo creo que además de esas, todas las que podamos encontrar en el camino teniendo en cuenta este gran desafío y bueno, ahora estamos en la formulación del Plan de Acción de Género y Cambio Climático y en la implementación de esta estrategia de largo plazo. Muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad de compartir esta experiencia. Thank you, um, thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much for, for reminding us the relevance of taking into account the diversity of our societies and the importance of integrating gender equality considerations from an intersectionality perspective into concrete climate measures and, and targets and, and how capacity building and the development of planning instruments related to just transition are also key elements to support this process. Thank you very much. Um, so our next panelist is uh, Ms. Fleur Newman. Uh, Ms. Newman leads the work uh, on gender and climate change under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreement, and is the gender focal point and focal point for women at the UN Climate Change Secretariat. Ms. Newman is a lawyer by training who, before joining the UN, spent 10 years practicing law in the private sector in areas including climate change, sustainability, energy, and international law. And throughout her career, Fleur has, uh, um, an, has been an advocate for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. So thank you for joining us today, Fleur. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Verenia. And thank you to the NDC Partnership and, um, and partners for the invitation to, to share some perspectives um, from the international process with you today uh, on International Women's Day. So um, next slide, please. The international process, um, we've been hearing, we've heard just now about the um, what's happening at a national level guided by the, the, the uh, international process, the Paris Agreement and, and its um, objectives. So within the international process, it has taken time for parties to the UNFCCC to fully understand the imperative of taking gender considerations into account when developing climate policies and actions. But there has been progress in this regard, in part because the, of the activities and work facilitated through the Lima Work Programme on Gender and its Gender Action Plan. The five priority areas of the Gender Action Plan, or GAP, were identified as being essential to addressing challenges and advancing implementation of gender responsive and ideally transformative climate policy and action. This lack of understanding of the role of things like gender analysis in informing more effective climate policy and action was seen as a key challenge that needs to be overcome. And we've heard already the, the continuing need for capacity building. And the gap includes activities under each of the, the, uh, four, the first four priority areas that seek to address this lack of understanding, knowledge and skills within governments and more broadly within organisations and businesses who are taking action on climate change. Next slide, please. 
And you can see from the timeline that there is a correlation between the development and, and agreement on these successive work programs and gender action plans at the international level, and an increase in the number of NDCs that make reference to gender. From only a few in, um, in INDCs that were there before the adoption of the Paris Agreement to 64 in the INDCs in 2016, which obviously included Nigeria. Noting that, this, that these were all in INDCs from non-Annex 1 or developing countries. And then we come to 2021, where there is now 114 out of 164 NDCs. And in 2022, 124 out of 166 NDCs that have a reference to gender. The updated or new NDCs, which were captured in the October 2021 NDC synthesis report that the Secretariat prepared saw developed country NDCs with references to women and gender. Um, and that was the first time in a, in a synthesis report that we'd seen that. While causation is difficult to draw between the evolution and work on gender and climate change under the gender and climate change agenda item of the COP, it is striking that there has been significant progress in the breadth and depth of considerations on gender and women in the updated and new NDCs from 2021 and 2022. Our an analysis indicated that parties who referred to their planned gender sensitive or gender responsive climate action generally have elaborated on gender aspects in the context of specific sectors including energy, agriculture, health, disaster risk reduction, water, fisheries, land use and forestry and education. Some specifically highlighted the importance of gender responsive capacity building, finance and technology for gender specific action. And many parties that referred to gender in their NDCs treated it as a cross cutting issue as we've seen in the examples today to be addressed across adaptation and mitigation, with some focusing more on adaptation and some considering gender exclusively in the context of adaptation. The analysis shows a significant increase in cross-cutting agenda integration in NDCs. Overall, we can conclude from our analysis that parties are increasingly considering gender in their NDCs and recognizing gender integration as a means of increasing the ambition and effectiveness of their climate action. Many affirm that they will take gender into account not only in planning, but also in NDC implementation, which is a good start. Next slide, please. However, when we anal analyze the long-term strategies for a synthesis report we prepared last year on, and, and this synthesis report is looking at reporting of gender responsive climate policies, plans, strategies and action in the latest nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, national adaptation programs of action, national communications and long term low emission development strategies that have been submitted to the Secretariat. And we identified an interesting and somewhat puzzling trend. While gender is increasingly being mentioned in more significant ways in NDCs, significant or meaningful mentions beyond demographics or general statements about gender equality in long-term strategies was found in less than 25% and to total mentions of gender were less than 50% of submitted um, LT-LEDs. So despite the increasing attention in the short to medium-term climate policy documents of the NDC and equally um, also in national adaptation plans, a majority of strategies that are setting long-term pathways for transformation do not include how the work on achieving gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls will contribute to this transformation, even for countries that are including gender in their NDCs. Yet we know that gender equality will not be sorted in the next five year timeframe of the NDC cycle and that without attention to gender equality, the transformation set out in the long-term strategies will likely not be met. Having said that, those long-term strategies that do reference gender equality and how it will contribute to the necessary transformation provide insight 
and good lessons for other countries on what can be done. We've heard two of those examples here today from Nigeria and Colombia with some really great uh, pointers for what's worked and where the challenges remain. Our analysis also identified a few developed country long-term strategies that have considered gender equality in detail. Two that I will mention today are Spain and Belgium. The Spanish long-term strategy makes express reference to the link between their climate neutrality target and a just transition, noting that the important transformation that climate neutrality implies will only be viable if it's done with equity and social justice inequality between women and men with special attention to those who are most vulnerable and the eradication of energy poverty. The long-term strategy goes into further detail on how gender will take into, be taken into account in the context of the energy sector transition, highlighting the results of a survey conducted in Spain that revealed that in 2018, women represented 28.5% of the workforce of companies in the energy sector with the greatest gaps in the operating personnel and in senior management. And this was consistent with a 2019 ARENA report that found women occupied only 32% of jobs in the renewables in industry in the, throughout the world. Spain are also cognizant of the relationship between gender and energy consumption and the need to analyze the different patterns of consumption disaggregated by sex from an inter intersectional gender perspective in order to be able to apply measures to favor, uh, in favor of decarbonization that take into account the different patterns detected. The Belgian long-term strategy also links gender equality and women's empowerment to opportunities arising from a fair and equitable, equitable transi transition. Noting that one of the pillars of the transition is to ensure that opportunities are equally accessible by women and that the resulting benefits are equ equitably distributed. Therefore, they reason, it is essential to approach it from a gender perspective in order to guarantee that women are an integral part of the transformation of the economy. Belgium also identified that gender diversity brings substantial co-benefits as women contribute to the development of new perspectives and improved collaboration in the process. Actions that would be taken to support these objectives include strengthening the capacity of women's organizations to manage their own businesses and increasing the presence of women in STEM fields of study and employment. Other long-term strategies from developed countries took either a cross-sectoral economy-wide approach to integrating gender and linked to things like the SDG5 implementation, such as Germany's, or as part of a feminist foreign policy, such as Sweden's, or with a particular focus on one aspect, such as adaptation, and that was Denmark. What is clear is that more capacity building and awareness raising is required to ensure that work that countries have started on gender responsive and transformative climate policy and action under the, their NDCs informs and transforms their work on long-term strategies. And so events such as today's are an important contribution to that objective. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fleur. Thank you so much for, for your contributions and for sharing you know, key, key barriers that you know, many countries still face to, to better understand the gender differentiated impacts of, uh, of climate and the relevance uh, to design and implement climate actions that take into consideration different needs and priorities between women and men, as well as other groups that are not always part of the decision-making process. And also for pointing out that we have seen an improvement in the integration of gender into NDCs, but this effort still needs to be translated into concrete actions on the ground. And there is a need to, to now shift and put a lot of our attention to the long-term strategies to make sure there is a long-term commitment to remove gender structural inequalities, uh, um, barriers and address inequalities. So thank you very much for your contributions. Um, so now um, many thanks to the, to the panelists. Now we will move to the Q&A uh, section. Um, I, uh, I believe um, we are seeing now a few questions uh, coming in. Um, I see there was one in the chat. Um, 
Let me just, uh, um, so there is a comment there, uh, but there is also um, the word, I'm gonna read it so the translators can also uh, uh, translate it. And it says, uh, so this, this uh, question comes from a, a colleague um, called uh, Michelle Penas Nels. Um, and she's uh, sharing some experience that uh, they have uh, um, uh, conducted. And they're, see, they're saying that, you know, that they have seen in their interviews that non-state actors uh, and that many claim lacking capacity development um, to participate. And in addition, meaningful spaces of participation were not necessarily available or, or set up, uh, or, or, or these were set up in too short notice um, for, for stakeholders to be able to attend and to have a, a effective uh, participation. And so she's asking, you know, if, if uh, um, particularly, I guess this, this question goes to Colombia, Nigeria, if there, if, uh, if you were able to address these kind of issues in, in, in the countries, like how to improve the planning process uh, to make sure that stakeholders um, have um, the, the platform that they need, the information that they need to engage in these uh, consultations uh, uh, in, in, in the best way possible, in the most effective way possible. So I will give the floor to uh, um, Ms. Halima uh, Abawa uh, to respond and then to Jessica. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the floor. Uh, so basically, I, um, I believe the person is asking about um, what we've been able to do with regards align non-state actors, right? Uh, participation in the processes, whether it's NDC, LTS, or LTV, and the NAP process. For us, yes, I do agree. Sometimes the timing is quite short. Uh, but for us, it's like we already have that ICCC, that platform that enables multi stakeholder participation. Though it's kind of a representation of the different stakeholder groups, but what we were able to do was to move the discussion to the state level, to the sub-national level, where uh, we were able to go around, we have six geopolitical zones. I totally agree that might not be enough, but at least as Fleur would say, it's a starting point. We did were able to get more people participate when we get when we got to the sub-national level. Uh, so it's about being able to reach, access the, or allow your organization to be accessed by non-state uh, participants. But then being able to reach them too uh, is hindered by issues of funding. You know, uh, you as a coordinating ministry have just this much, if at all, in the budget. And it can only take representative uh, areas and allow access to represent, well, not as many non-state actors, but as we keep trying to improve the process and um, we'll see how it goes. This was what, well, what's been with us, what's worked and what didn't work, but that funding too, apart from the short time, is uh, one of the uh, blowers right below the belt. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alima. Uh, Jessica, do you want to come in? Si sí, en Colombia se reconoce la importancia de los procesos participativos. La actualización de la NDC que se da en el 2020 se hace con un proceso participativo, sobre todo intersectorial. Participaron de todos los sectores, diferentes entes de gobierno, ministerios, el Departamento Nacional de Planeación, el Departamento de Estadística Nacional. En ese proceso participativo se consulta en bases y fuentes la información de características eh, diferenciales 
sobre las personas que van a estar en los territorios donde se implementan las NDC. Sin embargo, ese fue un primer proceso participativo que deja por fuera eh, muchas de las personas que están involucradas en estos procesos del cambio y de transformación, sobre todo de cara al, a este nuevo gobierno que plantea unas estrategias de eh, cambio bastante eh, ambiciosas y con una perspectiva de cambio climático que necesita más procesos de consulta. Eso es en el 2020. Al 2023 tenemos un fortalecimiento de esos procesos participativos, las comunidades indígenas y, los, y las comunidades afrocolombianas y los pueblos indígenas fueron consultados en unos espacios no formales, porque los formales eh, son espacios de consulta previa donde se toman unas decisiones desde las leyes consuetudinarias de los pueblos afrocolombianos y las comunidades indígenas, pero se hicieron en unos espacios no formales porque la diversidad de las comunidades, además de la diversidad eh, de lenguas que se hablan en esas comunidades o el dialecto propio de las comunidades, dificultaba mucho esos procesos. Sin embargo, en esos procesos no formales se recogieron necesidades y propuestas para la formulación de las apuestas de, de la estrategia de largo plazo. Con las organizaciones de mujeres, que también tienen una diversidad bastante amplia, lo que se hizo fueron procesos no solamente de consulta y procesos participativos, sino procesos de fortalecimiento de capacidades que les permitieran a las mujeres participar de una manera sustantiva, de una manera efectiva y generar unas propuestas. En estos procesos participativos fueron ellas mismas quienes generaron las agendas, quienes estuvieron de relatoras, quienes estuvieron de moderadoras, quienes recogieron la información, organizaron logísticamente los territorios, estábamos en una época de pandemia, entonces ellas eh, eh, gestionaron los recursos también para poder acceder a los medios virtuales y tecnológicos que les permitieran hacer esa participación y lo que se hizo fue contar con organizaciones de nivel nacional que tuvieran un liderazgo y trayectoria bastante fuertes, organizaciones que congregaran otras muchas de, de, de varios territorios y a partir de allí tener un enlace con las líderes de esas, de esas organizaciones que permitiera construir propuestas colectivas. En este proceso, en donde se está construyendo 2023, la estrategia de transición justa de la fuerza laboral y el plan de, de acción de género y cambio climático, eh, lo que se pretende es recoger de esos primeros procesos participativos qué se quedó por fuera, qué falta por incluir, reconocer las nuevas oportunidades que hay para las, los procesos de consulta y de anclaje territorial, porque esto se hizo más desde el nivel nacional, en este segundo momento, plan de acción de género y estrategia de transición justa de la fuerza laboral va a ser el nivel territorial y lo que nos va a permitir la presencialidad. Entonces, básicamente esperamos seguir avanzando. En eso estamos. Muchas gracias, Jessica. Uh, Flor, maybe if uh, if you want to um, also come in uh, and, and briefly maybe share uh, from from your experience in in terms. I know this is an uh, also an, an issue and an area that was uh, highlighted in the Gender Action Plan, the, the, the reality and the need to make sure that different actors, um, particularly women at the grassroots level, uh, have the opportunity to participate in these processes. Do you want to come in uh, uh, briefly on, on this and comment on this? Thank you. Thank you. I think just to, to sort of reiterate some of the things that have already been said, and in particular, Halima's point about the the, the having infrastructure, having a, a mechanism for consultation is so is going to be one of the key things that allows for um, th that consultation to happen and to happen in a way that is orderly and systematic, and that includes um, subnational governments, uh, it includes women's organisations, but it's that that need for coordination both horizontally and vertically within government and then also to 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 build that out uh, to whether it's to have citizens um uh, assemblies or it's to to always have that place on the the coordination mechanism the climate change coordinate 
having a climate change coordination mechanism and then making sure that that, that mechanism includes uh, different groups. Thank you so much, Fleur. Um, so now I, I would like to launch a poll. Uh, we want to know more about what is happening in, in your countries. We want to, to hear from the participants uh, and, and it will be important for data collection as, as well. So we are um, sharing uh, uh, the, the questions also translated into uh, Spanish and, and French on the screen. So you will see the, you know, the, the poll as such with the multiple choice. Um, and, and you can also see the, the questions translated into Spanish. I'm gonna read uh, briefly the, the, the questions so the translators can also, uh, the interpreter, sorry, can translate the questions. The first question, are you meaningfully considering any of the following in developing or supporting development of the long-term uh, strategies? The second question, in the past, which of these entry points have you or your uh, organization utilized to support inclusive and or gender responsive considerations into national climate change planning. And the third, if you have worked on just transition at a national, sectoral or local level, have you included considerations examining differences of impacts or benefits for women and men? So please kindly uh, uh, um, respond to the poll, share the information with, with us. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the questions and the multiple choice uh, have been translated. You can see that in the, in the back of, of the screen. Um, and we will be very happy to, to, to quickly look at the, um, at the responses before we move into the, the closing part of the webinar. Um, so I don't know, colleagues, if we give uh, one more minute and then we close the, the poll. Shall we then close the poll and see if we have enough uh, responses? Okay, great. So really interesting. So for the first one, so we, oh, we see a good percentage of countries uh, integrating uh, a gender approach. Uh, also, it's really interesting to see that uh, many of the countries uh, participating today have included um, indigenous peoples and local communities as, as key stakeholders. Um, so that's really interesting to see about the first one. The second one um, about um, which of these entry points uh, have uh, then have the, the participants or their organizations used? So inclusive stakeholder engagement processes, we were already mentioning how to improve the participation, the effective participation of stakeholders into these consultation processes. Also the idea of ensuring that these spaces are not just like one-off uh, during the revision of the NDCs, for example, or the development of the long-term strategies, but also try to make sure that um, long-term um, coordination mechanisms and consultation uh, mechanisms are uh, established. So really interesting to see that. And then for the last question, um, if, uh, if countries have worked on just transition and if they have considered these aspects, and it's really uh, encouraging to see that they are incorporating this uh, differentiation uh, between women and men needs and priorities. So very interesting. Thank you for, for, um, for sharing uh, this information. And so we are now coming to, to um, the end of the webinar. So I would like to give the, the floor to Ms. Amanda McKee, Director of Knowledge and Learning uh, of the NDC Partnership Global Support Unit to share closing remarks with us. Amanda, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rania. Um, and thank you as well for, for moderating us through this really interesting discussion today. And I want to thank our panelists as well, Halima, Jessica, Fleur. We got some really useful um, input from you on what's worked. And I think more importantly, what some of the opportunities are ahead. So this International Women's Day webinar is actually the second webinar that we've had as part of a new series. Um, raising Ambition Through Partnership that we're co-hosting together with GIZ, UNDP, and the World Resources Institute. 
And the idea with this webinar series is to really reflect on where we've made significant progress, um, particularly through the update of the NDCs in the last round, what we can learn from that and how we can carry that forward as countries are working on their long-term development strategies, as they're preparing to update their NDCs in the next round. And what we know, um, and I think what was highlighted here today is that delivering on ambitious climate action really requires these multiple tools. It requires short-term, medium-term planning through our NDCs. It requires long-term planning through the long-term um, low emission development strategies, LT LEDs, as well as integration into countries' development strategies. And gender equity and social inclusion are a critical element to aligning all of these frameworks and ensuring that implementation um, is not just ambitious, but it, that it's equitable and it's just. Um, I wanted to just quickly share a couple of um, insights from the NDC partnership and some of the support that we had provided on NDC updates through what we called the Climate Action Enhancement Package. I think this really echoes, um, especially what Fleur was saying in terms of some of the trends that we've seen. But um, of um, the 55 countries that we analyzed, 53 of them um, included specific elements on gender equity in their updated NDC. Um, and 49 of those received direct support from NDC partnership members to do so. So support um, focused on technical assistance for collecting um, disaggregated data, analytical support um, to help in the development of documents, stakeholder engagement, and also specific activities around raising awareness on gender specific climate impacts and capacity building programs, which you heard a lot about today. And so the partnership is working to strengthen our support to countries on gender equality, on social inclusion, youth engagement. And we really appreciate the commitment to sharing guidance on how to do so that we received from the, the panelists today. Um, looking forward, we recently launched a thematic call um, where we're bringing targeted support to countries particularly to foster alignment between their NDCs and their LT-LEDs and to develop the, the capacities for their sustained updating and implementation. And so the efforts under this thematic call will focus on supporting both the development and the refinement of countries' LT-LEDs um, and also helping them to align these with short and medium-term planning, which hopefully will enable countries to unlock uh, higher ambition in their next NDC update cycle, which is, is just around the corner. And some of the points that I heard today in terms of how we can incorporate um, gender equality into that support going forward, we heard a few times about really the importance of not just holistic, but sustained multi-stakeholder engagement. Um, and this includes both at the national level, but also at the subnational level. Coupled with this is the high level political engagement, but then also the importance of making sure that we're tracking this over time, um, that we have proper monitoring and evaluation systems in place to really understand what the impact is. So this is critical when we talked about that, that sustained engagement. And this is one area of support that countries will be able to request um, assistance through this thematic call. We also heard um, quite a few interventions on how important taking that gender perspective is to engage different sectors. Um, it's really not a one size fits all solution. Um, and when we talk about when we talk about gender, it's not um, a homogeneous entry point. And so the importance of building up technical capacities on this topic, including engagement of um, different experts throughout the process, but also building up the capacity of public officials where um, significant gender gaps exist around the understanding there as well. So that thematic call um, has been launched and it's open on a rolling basis. So we're inviting countries to submit support and certainly through the partners here on the call today, um, where we have our, our gender and youth um, associate Hannah, who's on the call as well, 
So we'd invite you to reach out to discuss any of that. Um, but just to give the reassurance that there is support available for countries to think about these topics and how they can incorporate them um, into their policy documents moving forward. The last thing I want to um, mention is that we do, I, I did want to share details on our next session in this webinar series that will be led by GIZ and will take place on the topic of nature-based solutions and climate ambition, and that will take place in April. So if you keep an eye on our social media, our website will be sharing further details on that and how to register once um, a date is confirmed. So just to wish everyone um, a final happy International Women's Day. And Rani, I'm happy to turn it back to you to close. Thank you so much, Amanda. Yes, thank you. So um, again, colleagues joining us today, this is a great opportunity to ensure that we incorporate these social dimensions and gender equality considerations into this work. There is a, a good opportunity to do that. So let's take advantage of it. And again, we are at the end of the webinar. So my gratitude to the panelists for their remarkable contributions. And thank you to all the participants for joining us today. I hope this was helpful. Uh, um, and we look forward to seeing these critical dimensions well integrated into the country proposals and of course the long-term strategies overall. So thank you so much and goodbye. Have a nice day. Or